episode of Finside the NFL. We're going to talk about how the Miami Dolphins are bringing in one of the top center slash guard prospects of the draft for a top 30 visit. Also, did Tua Tungvaloa hint that an extension is close to being done at his luau? Also, he confirmed that he is using John Beck in 3D QB. We will talk about that. Also, we'll talk about a few other prospects being brought in for visits and so much more do me the favor smash the like button subscribe if you're new let's get into this you have got to be kidding me Jalen Waddle has a dolphin touchdown is good fin nation what's good it's your boy reason and we are back here for another one hope everyone is having a fantastic start to the weekend as we get into this shout out to everyone who's already showed up in the chat for this saturday matinee all the way from fox and around to lord ferguson of aberdeen pendas pro special df carrie price uh chuck fins up Dolphin Man, Jared, Lemony Crawdad, Scorpion King, Senor Relejos, aka the Watch Mister, Garn79, Robert Thomason, shout out to you as well for coming through. Robert Carrillo, um, who else we got here? Kevin Williams, Q, um, Bleed Mascara, Michael Simmons, um, Ball God 203 6193 ASNF Aladino Scotty. Hello, Lisa. How are you doing? And Chris Solo. Shout out to all of you, as well as Russell, Jeffrey Ward, and Corey Walker. Shout out to each and every one of you. I saw Scorpion King uh, in, in shout out to Mark. Um, I saw Scorpion King in the chat. Man, you know, is that Drake response real? Because if so, it's Scorpio season up in this, huh? You know, six God came through if that thing's real. Um, Shout out to Austin. A <laughs> lot of members on here, dude. It's crazy how quickly this channel has grown. Happy to be a part of it and happy to have you a part of it. Watch, mister. Um, Man, you know, you always show your love throughout the season and in the off season. I appreciate it, man. I really do. I really do, man. Lead mascara says his Nike Dunks came in the mail. There you go. You're gonna be, you're gonna be watching. You're gonna be watching the draft and your fresh kicks. That a boy. That a boy. Listen, something I wanted to talk about, and just based off a conversation I had yesterday. What's going on, Jeff? Um, you know, I really want to stress this to people. You know, like, you know, people have to stop. You know following fall following falling in love what's up ricky my goat falling in love with prospects to the point where you know they get stubborn about them and they argue about them and you can really tell people are, are setting themselves up for disappointment you know like and, and i'll bring it I'll, I'll bring it up what up tc you know devin a chin all right everyone knows how badly i wanted him last year all right, if we wouldn't have drafted him, you wouldn't have heard me crying about it. You know, it's the same thing with, you know, go back to 2020. You know how badly I wanted Tua, but also how badly I wanted Tristan Wirfs and Jonathan Taylor. Now, Tristan Wirfs especially. Now, this team tried to move up and trade for to get into a position to get Tristan Wirfs, and they still didn't get them. And, yeah, I was disappointed. 
I was a little upset, especially when you saw that first season. But, you know, I, I, I understand the process. You know, if you like one player, you know, there's over 200 players selected in the draft. You know, you're, you're the shot of you, the player you want, especially when you get outside the first round, it turns into a crab shoot. Right, which is why I pat myself on the back even harder with my track record since I started doing this because I've been pretty, you know, pretty, pretty spot on with a lot of selections they've made. But it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a process and it's it's literally a crapshoot. And you can tell people, I'll tell you right now, and we'll talk about Jackson Powers Johnson. I, I can tell you right now, there are going to be tons of people absolutely bitter if we don't draft a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson when he's on the board at 21. They won't look at the history of the league, not just Greer when it comes to drafting premium positions. They just get locked in and dead set on their guy. And if it doesn't happen, oh, you know, arms will get thrown up deals will be made like in term, big deals will be made about it in terms of without thinking like for example i do not get how people are not understanding the need at edge i really don't and you know everyone seems to think there's no need at edge yeah there is guys let, let's 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 put things into perspective for a second here Bradley Chubb has a torn ACL. Bradley Chubb, the out in his contract, is in 2025. Okay? So next offseason, they can get out of it. Let me put this into perspective for you. That Chubb injury, which I've heard rumblings, well, I can confirm this. I've heard from... Three different people, Bradley Chubb will not be ready to begin the season. Like, I've been told that's basically only a foregone conclusion. I've also heard rumblings. I haven't got 110% confirmation like I did with Connor Williams, which I ended up being right about, about his ACL injury being worse than it is. But I've heard rumblings that Bradley Chubb's injury is not just a clean-cut ACL tear, that it's a little bit worse than that. So let me, you know, I, I've even heard numbers that this guy could only be 70, 80% by November. So let me throw this at you. Bradley Chubb, okay? You have your out in 2025. Right now, Bradley Chubb is going to be 28 in a few months. I believe he turns 28 in like, June what like yeah like June I think he turns 28 in okay so now you're going to be going into a season 20 and I'm talking about 2025 not this season coming up the season after and we're using the information I just gave you now you're going into season 2025 where you didn't have a fully healthy 2024 you don't know where he's going to be at he's going to be turning 29 and he is going to have a cap hit of $29 million over the next three years at the age of 29, 30, 31. Now, they have to eat a little bit of money if they trade him or release him post-June 1st in 2025. But they save $20.2 million by either cutting him or releasing him post-June 1st. If his knee is not where it needs to be. If his performance is not where it needs to be, y'all are going to wish they got out ahead of it. That's a fact. And you can tell how serious they're taking it by looking at bringing in a Carl Lawson and a Shaq Barrett. What does that tell me? That tells me they're looking for another name to pair with Shaq Barrett and Jalen Phillips because they don't know when Chubb's coming back and when he's going to be good to go. It's not like they're relying on, you know, some UDFA to get them by for a few weeks in the rotation. 
Hell, I'll go even this far. If Cam Good wasn't hurt, I bet you they'd still be looking for another name like that. And then let's go even further. Let's talk about money. Jalen Phillips is going to probably have his 50-year option activated. So he's going to be making $13 million in 2025 when they activate that, okay? So 2025, he'll be on his 50-year option. and 2026, he'll need new money. Bradley Chubb's hit. For 2025 and 2026 and 2027 is 29 million dollars. Do you really think they are going to say let's just ballpark it? Let's just say they give Jalen Phillips because the caps by the time he gets paid in 2026, the cap could be up another 60 million. So we could be talking about like a 310, 350 million cap by this time. Let's say he gets 20 million. All right, let's just throw that round number out there. Okay, let's say he comes back next year. He, he blows up. He has a good year. Do you really think they're going to be paying fifty million dollars for two pass rushers? And Siler's going to need Sealer's going to need new money by that time, so they'll probably re up him. You really think they're going to be paying one guy twenty nine million and the other guy around twenty million to, for for two edge rushers? No, my friends. The play is going to be Phillips takes that twenty million and essentially takes Chubb's spot in the cap hit. Chubbs moved, and they want to have a rookie take Phillips' spot. That way, you can have two high-level players, one on an actual contract, and the other one playing on a rookie deal. That's the cheapest and most cost-efficient way, especially when we're also adding the fact two his money is going to be on the books by this time, too. So, I don't really get people's whole pushback on the edge need. It's a real need when you start thinking long-term. People are thinking too short-term with this. This is a long-term play. The same way Cam Smith was a long-term play last year. They had Jalen Ramsey. They had Xavier Howard. But they had a guy who they had a high grade on, fall into the lap in the second round. They knew Xavier Howard would be on his way out. They knew they had a bunch of short-term deals on deck at corner, and they drafted Cam Smith. Trying to get out ahead of the curve. The same thing. It's the exact same thing. You got to start looking at the money. You got to start thinking about the future here. Listen, there's, there's a reason they put that out in 2025. I mean, he signed a five-year deal. And look at how quickly they put that out in. They put in that out after two years. They didn't even put that out in after three years. That out hits after two. So that's why they're looking at it this way. And that's why edge is a real need. Now, I'm sure they're going to add one out of the UDFA crop. That's pretty much uh, more, more than one out of the UDFA crop. That's pretty much a given, right? That's pretty much just a given. That's going to happen. But it's a real, it's, a, it's just like safety. Think about safety. Not only do you need depth, you don't know what's going to happen with Javon Holland. You don't have a 50-year option. Especially if he's asking for the world and everything in it, Chico. You better have someone on his backup option. That's my next big board I'll be dropping for all y'all. So, I mean, think about this. Between Poyer and Javon Holland, you don't have any long-term certainty at that position. You literally have no... Long-term solution right now because Javon Holland is not locked down long-term. Jordan Poyer is on a short-term deal. And Elijah Campbell is the other option. You have no long-term solution right now. 
at either safety position. And we have a defensive coordinator that likes to rotate in three safeties at a time in some packages. So technically, technically, you need another fringe starter to be in that three safety rotation package. And you need depth beyond Elijah Campbell. Safety is a very, very serious option at 55. Now at 21, if Cooper Dijon's on the board and they took him, I would not be mad by any stretch of the imagination. The guy's phenomenal. But other than him, I don't see anyone that can play safety. May you know, either even Tyler Newbin. I don't know if he doesn't go. He probably doesn't go until the second. The majority of that that top of the safety class is probably going to go in the second. So, you know, and TC's right. We need more picks. This is why I keep saying we need to add a third or a fourth. This is real. So we got real, real needs. And people are just focused on the offensive line. There's a reason why they brought back Isaiah Wynn. And, and let me say this. Everyone's so dead set on a center. What do you think they're doing with Aaron Brewer? I'm going to tell you right now, Aaron Brewer is penciled in at center. And it penciled in at starting center. Andre James was the backup plan to Connor Williams. Andre James signed, re-signed with the Raiders the night before the new league year started. Aaron Brewer was the pivot. Now, there's centers in this draft like, you know, JPJ, Frazier. I mean, if you want to count Barton, Barton, that can play guard as well. But, you know, they've set themselves up. I, I've told all y'all, Eichenberg himself has been on record, been on record and said he fits best at right guard. Some of his best tape of last year was at right guard. I'm telling you, that battle right now is Jack Driscoll and Liam Eikenberg for right guard. And they have set themselves in a position where if someone doesn't fall in their lap, what happens? From everything we've learned, they're just going to dip into the free agency, the veteran free agency pool. Because they've basically been telling veteran free agents, sit on your hands until we're done. If we don't get what we like in the draft, we're coming back to you and we'll revisit this. So they are literally setting themselves up for BPA. And when they set themselves up for BPA, what has to jump to the forefront of your mind is premium positions. They are going to have higher grades on BPAs that are premium positions than non-premium positions. And another thing too, most teams usually have 18 maybe 18 to 22 first round grades with potentially four all right with potentially four quarterbacks going in the top 20 talent's going to be pushed down to us like that that's just the reality of the situation talent is going to be pushed down to us That's that's just where we're at. So, listen. You know, we're setting ourselves up for BPA. This is going to be very, very, very interesting. How this all works out. Um, personally, for me, you know, I, I think... Um, I think, I think, you know, I think edge is very much in play. Like, do not be shocked if Jared verse is on the board and they take a Jared verse, please do not be shocked. Do not be shocked. All right. Now I see there's question 
in the chat, and this is a very interesting question, and I'm going to give you an answer right now because I do agree, but they, I mean, they signed what's his face. Um, they resigned. What's his, what's that jabroni's face? Jake Bailey. So I see in the, in the chat reason. Let me, let me pull this up here. Let me pull this up here for all y'all so I can cover this for you. Cause this is a, the first person to ask me this. All right. The first person to ask me this, let me, let me see where if I can find it. Okay. Reason, which punter do you like in the draft? We need one badly. I don't know if they're going to draft one after just, you know, signing. You know, I, I don't think that happens, to be honest. With you. If they were going to sign one or draft one, sorry. Ryan Rayco, Ryan Rayco out of BYU. That's who I like in this draft. I think he's a beast. I think he, he can be I think he's gonna be good at the next level. Ryan Raycow from BYU, the BYU punter. Um so I mean he averaged almost what he averaged like forty eight point four yards per punt, I think it was. Um that guy can boom it. Can boom it. All right, and they even ran some trick plays with him too. It's crazy, but you know he had some absolute freaking rockets. Um, he, he's a he's a good he's a good punter. That's who I that's who I would target if I was targeting a punter out of BYU. Ryan Reiku, Ryan Reiko, however you pronounce that at the end of at the end there. So, um, go check him out. He's from BYU. How you spell his name is Ryan and then R-E-H-K-O-W. Ryan Rako. Go check him out. That guy can absolutely punt it. They even ran some trick plays with him. And I think against Oregon State, they ran a trick play with him and stuff. So he can punt it. Now, a lot of people like uh, Tory Taylor out of Iowa. I think he's good too. But I just see something in Ryan Rako that I don't know, man. I think uh, – I think that guy, that guy's got special written on him. So we'll see, we'll see. But just paying J Jake Bailey, I haven't looked at his contract, so I don't know if you can get out of it like that. But you know, that's that's where I'm at. So if you want to talk about punting, if you want to talk about punting, yeah, I definitely think left tackle is on the board too. Left tackle, man. There's a lot of places they can go. <laughs> So there's a lot of options they can go with in the draft, right? So, um, yeah. So shout out for that. Good question. What my punter try to? Who? What punter would I want? So, um, Ryan Rayco from BYU is the guy that I like. Um, now continuing on, let's get into the news here. Fret not, offensive line wanters. And Jackson Powers Johnson fans, per source, Oregon's Jackson Powers Johnson is among the players the Dolphins are summoning to team headquarters for a top 30 visit. Miami is very much intrigued by last year's Remington Trophy winner, the award given to the nation's top center. Now, I'm going to hit you with some, with some facts here, all right? This does not mean they're taking him at 21. There are a few factors into this, okay? Number one, go look at their top 30 visits so far. Their top 30 visits so far have been with guys that this is the closest they've got to bringing in that's known to us to bring in a first rounder for a top 30 visit. This would be the first one that's known to us if he does go in the first round. That's number one. Number two, like I said earlier, 21. That is with, with potentially four or five quarterbacks going in the top 20. That's going to push talent. Like, let's say, let's say you have 20 first round grades. I can guarantee five of those are not quarterback. 
I can guarantee you that. So what does that tell you? If five go, right, let's say, you know, you only have three of those are first round grades. Already you're getting two non-first round grades pushing down talent towards you. So that's what I got to say, number one. Uh, and, and, and number two, sorry. And if you look at Greer's history, the closest they've came to drafting a center under Greer in the first round was Cesar Ruiz in 2020. Now, I heard that was originally the target at 26. They were shocked due to Eric McCoy um, being already on the Saints roster. They were shocked. They didn't think the Saints would take him. Sure enough, they did. And then, you know, we then we handed it. A card was made up having DeAndre Swift's name on it. Then we ended up trading the pick back. At 26, the first round grades are pretty much ran through. So what does that tell you? Cesar Ruiz, at best, was a bottom of the first round grade to them. More likely, he was a top of the second round grade. And they were targeting it at 26 once you got out of the first round grades. Okay, that's that's number two. Number three, and this is a big one. And I want everyone to listen to me on this. In league circles, Jackson Powers Johnson isn't even a lock as the number one center in this draft, let alone the number one guard in this draft. I hate to be the one to tell everyone this, but here's the deal. If you have, I don't know if you've been living under a rock. We talked about him on Fin Too Deep. I've talked about him quite a bit. In league circles, Graham Barton is the one that's viewed as potentially the top center in this draft. He has skyrocketed. Now, if you want, if you're going to say reason, who would you have as your center one? It's Zach Frazier. Zach Frazier, to me, is going to be the best Day one, plug and play center out of this class. Most experienced out of those three guys playing center between him, Barton, and JPJ. Wrestling background, nastiness, dominant at times. He can also play guard too. Zach Frazier, to me, if you want a plug and play day one center out of this draft, it's Zach Frazier. Remember, this was Jackson Powers Johnson first full season playing center. And then when you talk at the other guard positions, yeah, he's played the other guard positions. But what we're not talking about thousands of snaps. At right guard, he has over 400 snaps. You know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, a, a vastly experienced player here. And now I'll go even further. This. There is word that he is slipping to the second round. That Jackson Powers Johnson is not viewed as a first round guy. And what's happening is this. Okay. Got invited to the senior bowl. Had a hamstring hamstring injury. He's had concussion issues. All right. He's had groin and hip issues and the quiet rumblings about him right now and the medical is that there's neck issues the medical is very important for Jackson Powers Johnson very important Remember, in 2021, he only started one game at right guard and one game at left guard. He actually started a game at defensive tackle, too, because they had depth issues at the time. All right? Then you look at 2022. He only started one game. He played in 12, but he started in one, but right guard for the most part. And then he started 13 games this year, played in all those 13 games at center. So, 
You know, the medicals are a big, big thing with Jackson Powers Johnson that no one is talking about. No one is talking about the medicals. Enough. You got lower extremity issues on alignment already. You've got concussion issues, and now there's potential neck issues. If Jackson Powers Johnson does not go in the first round, now you know why. It's going to be medicals. Teams are that is going to tell you teams are afraid of the medicals. So people need to be more aware of Jackson Powers Johnson and what what what's happening right now. Because people are just glossing over it. Because they see people on X or whatever talking about them and all of a sudden they want them. You see a couple highlight clips and all of a sudden you want them. Instead of doing the research, doing the film work yourself. You're just accepting at a face value and falling in love with the player. That is a very, very dangerous recipe. So, he's not even... Not only is he not a lock to go at 21 or be the best center in this draft due to potential medical issues, he's not even a lock to go in the first round. All right. So, and you can ask anyone who's who's, who's scouted or any scout about Jackson Power Johnson, they will tell you the same thing. And I will have Ryan Roberts on. And I will have Dante Colinelli on next week. And they will tell you the exact same thing. The medicals are big with him. So. I'm just saying. At 21. At 21. You could not be picking someone. Who lacks experience at the position. You want to put him at. All right. Who. Who. And that's, you know, Jackson Powers Johnson, right now where he's at in his development is he's a jack of all trades, but he's mastered none on the interior. He hasn't had time. He hasn't been given the reps or the time to master guard or center. He's been given basically one season at right guard and one season at center. And it's not like it was even in the SEC, people. So you got a lack of experience and you got potential medical red flags. <laughs> I need more of a guarantee and a certainty at 21. Now, if the Steelers take him at 20 or the Dolphins take him at 21 or he goes in the early 20s, that'll tell you that the medicals teams are okay with where the medicals are at. So, yeah, but again, see, here's the thing where you're messing, where you're missing it. Which one's the premium position? See, Latu medically retired the same way Jalen Phillips did. What position did Jalen Phillips go at? Jalen Phillips went top 20. Why? Edge rusher's a premium position. Center is not a premium position. That's what also plays into the factor. It's the same reason as, put it this way. You will have guys, you will have teams take the third or fourth edge rusher who has crazy high traits, a crazy high ceiling, but he's raw in the developmental process. They will take that over the top, and I'm talking fully healthy, no medical issue. They will take that over the top interior player. Unless it's like Quentin Nelson and it's like a generational interior player. But we're not talking about JPJ is not generational. Both have medically retired. But the issue is they are premium positions. That's the difference. Premium position.
that's what you run into. And especially them coming off the injury and everything with Connor Williams. Yeah, they want a little certainty. They want a little certainty. I'm just saying. Hey, if they take Jackson Powers Johnson at 21 and the medicals check out, I'm totally on board with it. I'm fine with that. As long as the medicals check out. Brother, that's in your own mind. Go look at the draft. Center is not a premium position in the draft. You want to know how I know that? A, go look at draft histories. Go research the last 10 drafts. Go look at how many edges go before the top center. Go look at how many corners go before the top center. Go look at how many tackles go before the top center. Go look at how many receivers go before the top center. Go look at how many quarterbacks go before the top center. It is not a premium. It's not a premium position at all. That's not how it works. This isn't a go look at this game or that game. This is a look at the draft. You're talking about draft premium positions. Offensive tackle on the offensive line is the premium position. That's why they get paid like it. Center is not viewed as a premium position in the draft. Why? I'll hit you with why. Because the majority of the starters in the NFL... More second, more starters are found. More starters in the NFL were found in the second round than in the first. I'll do even one better. I'll do you even one better than that. And that's a fact. You can go look it up. Go look at how many centers are starting in the NFL and then go look at their draft position. What do you find? That second round, there's a lot more center round, second round starters than there are that. That's literally just a fact. And guess what? I'll do even better. If you go look from 2017 to 2022, there were as many sixth round and UDFA center starters as there were first round center starters in the NFL. So let me reiterate. There are more starters in the NFL that have been found in the second round than in the first. And there are as many between 2017 and 2022 as many starters found in the sixth round and the UDFA pool as there were in the first round. That's a fact. I don't know why you're trying to argue me with the draft when, sorry, Ron, there's a reason why you're a guy in the chat and I'm a guy up here with a draft track record that blows whatever you know about the draft out of the water. So try to argue that fact. Let me see someone argue that fact. That there are more first round, there are more starters at the center position found in the second round than the first. And there is just as many starters found in the sixth round in the UDFA pool as there are in the first round. Thank you very much. And goodbye to you. I don't know what else to say. That's a fact. Now you're trying to argue facts and history. So, you know what? I think you're the one who should do some homework and you're the one who needs to do your research because all you're doing it is basing off the Chiefs when you're saying it's because the Chiefs didn't have a center when the Chiefs go look at that. The Chiefs didn't have their bookend tackles. The Chiefs were missing guards in that Super Bowl. They weren't just missing a center. Like, go look at the facts. So goodbye to you. Take your L, run along. So that's where we're at with Jackson Powers Johnson. Again, I reiterate, because it's a crazy stat. There are more starters in the NFL that were found in the second round than the first, and there is just as many found in the sixth round and in the UDFA pool between 2017 and 2022. The numbers don't lie. Now you're li Now you're arguing numbers if you argue that. 
Just saying. So thank you very much. I bring facts. People bring their feelings and opinions. So let's keep it rolling and let's get into Tua because we got a lot to cover with Tua. Now with Tua Tungvaloa. Something that made headlines a couple days ago. Tua Tungvaloa reiterated that there will be no contract holdout. He plans to attend voluntary practices this spring. So we covered this earlier in what last week or the week before. And we, we made the argument about, hey, should he hold out or should he not hold out due to an article that um, Omar Kelly had put out. And I even said, hey, Omar, stop giving them ideas. You know what I mean? Um, and then you hear him pretty certain that he's coming to OTAs. You hear him. I mean, he's talking, and I'm going to play a clip here. I mean, let, let's talk about this. I mean, I'm going to ask you this. Does Tua Tungvalo, is Tua Tungvaloa hinting that an extension is almost done? Let me play this clip. This definitely feels like home to me. Um, you know, I, I've said this before, but this is where both of my kids, you know, were, were born. This is where we're going to raise, you know, our family uh, with me and Anna. And um, this is the, the city that, that, you know, chose me um, to be their quarterback. And I'm very grateful. I'm very honored for that. I don't take any of that lightly. And so, you know, I, I definitely call this home. Not only does he call this home, there was a key, key thing he said there. Key thing out of what he said when he was talking about his kids. And right, he said, this is both where both of my kids were born. And he said, this is where we're going to raise them. That's the key. When he said, this is where we're going to raise them. I mean, you got to be fairly confident that a deal is almost done. And I've heard the framework has pretty much been laid out for the last couple weeks. This thing's close. This thing is very, very close. And Dak not getting paid, I think, put this process back into high gear. But that's speaking with confidence. That's speaking with certainty that you're going to be raising your family here. You know, it would be more like if, if you weren't certain, it'd be more like, you know, I want to raise my family here, blah, 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 blah. You know, I want I want to continue to stay here. I want to be blah, 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 blah. That's where you'd be at. All right. That that's where that's where you'd be at. That is where you would you you you'd be speaking in a little bit more uncertainty. And to me, he's speaking in some certainty. I don't know. I think this is um I think this is I think this is I think he's 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 being pretty open. He's telling you without telling you that we're close here. This is going to get done. Sounds pretty freaking confident to me that his family is going to be remaining in Miami. And I don't think this is something as simple as him thinking, oh, we're going to continue to live down here while I go to another team. I don't think it's anything to do with that. So, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That is very interesting for me when, I, when you listen, right? You got to read between the lines. 
And it sure sounds like that contract is close to being done. It's sure close to being done. And from what I understand, they're, they, they haven't ever been that far off. And the framework has been pretty, pretty much in place for a few weeks now. Continuing on, Tua. Look at, he confirmed my boy Bobby out here. Um, I think for now, that's, that's all internal. Um, I want to keep that between me and, and John. But yes, everyone, <laughs> I, I have a quarterback coach. I am working with John Beck. So there you go. Tua confirms he's working with John Beck. He's confirmed he's working with 3D QB. Again, this is not his first QB coach. I've tried to tell people you can go back to 2021 and you can find pictures of them. I've posted a picture of them. He's had a quarterback coach before, and that was Wes Carroll of quarterback prep, who would basically started working with him through connections to perform. So this is not his first quarterback coach at the NFL level. Let's get that out of the way because people seem to be spinning this narrative that it is when that is, in fact, not the case. And anyone telling you that, they don't know what they're talking about and they haven't been paying attention. Which is crazy because the people saying it are Tua haters and they got him constantly under the microscope. I guess that one slipped under their nose, huh? But... Tua Tungulua confirms he's working with John Beck. He's working with 3D QB. Man, I cannot wait to see the results. We're already seeing a little bit of a mechanical difference. His release point looks quicker. It looks a little bit, a little bit higher too. Um, so, and, and and it looks like his he's keeping his front arm tight and nice but he's he's switched up his front arm mechanic a little bit too it looks like so listen we got to see it in action i got to see it in more training we're going to have nick hicks on this off season like i do every off season i was the first person in this community in this dolphins community to have nick hicks on and we'll continue that trend like we do every off season so i can't wait to have him back on for all of you wondering, oh, by the way, what's happening with Omar, maybe Omar will come on after um, the draft. He's got a lot going on in his uh, personal life right now, so it's just not working out. And I got a lot of stuff coming up in terms of I got a couple draft people coming on next week. I got big boards, then I got my shows with Richmond and Neil. It's just not working out. And then the week after next week is going to be hectic because the week after next week is the actual draft. Me and Neil are going to be dropping our – three round hand selected mock where we pick for every single team over the first three rounds and see how it falls to us. And then on top of that, we are, um, um, you know, I'm going to have my last final big board coming out cause I'm doing six this year, not five. So we got a lot coming for you guys over the next couple of weeks. So it's just going to work out better. And then May 11th, funny enough, right around when the schedule comes out, I'm going to be, going away for a week and I'm working on some content to have for you guys while I'm gone. So hopefully I can drop a few videos while I'm gone. So you guys can still have some con content from me. All right. But that's, uh, that's, that, that's what, what the deal is moving forward. All right. Shout out to Hallie D. Barry. I'm five minutes away from hard rock right now. I'm just sitting here thinking how close we are and what position this team is in to win something special, man. It hits you like a ton of bricks, right? I mean, we were one game away from winning our division last year. We should have sewn it up, but we were one game away. That Titans game, right? After that Titans loss, at the end of the season, everyone wanted to talk about how we lost to the Bills, how we lost to the Ravens. But what did I say after that Titans loss? I said, that's the game we're going to point back to if we don't win this division. And sure enough, we didn't win the division, and that's the game we all point back to. Where with three minutes left, a two-score lead, you got to close that out. And that was, and what's funny is people want to put that on two in the offense. Oh, if they could just get a first down. Oh, if they could just score points. Brother, you're going to excuse the defense and Vic Fangio giving up the lead in the last three minutes? You're just going to totally absolve the defense and that staff of any blame 
In what world are we living? In what world? Right? It goes back to the whole thing with Tyreek. Everyone wants to give Tyreek the excuse for his drops. Oh, he balls out. Oh, he led the league in pass and receiving yards. Well, Tua led the league in passing yards. But y'all put him on our microscope much more than Tyreek. And Tyreek hasn't had these numbers until Ty Tua came around. He wasn't doing this with Mahomes. So, you know. But yeah, we are we are close, man. We are very, very close. We, we are literally a team that if we get into the playoffs and we win a game, we could go on a run. That, that's the type of team we are. That's the type of talent we have. That's the type of coaching staff we have. That we just get that one win under our belt and we could go under on a run. And, look, and we could all of a sudden become one of the more dangerous teams in the NFL. But that all comes to game plan and execution by the players. Game plan by the staff, execution by the players. Just saying. Continuing on, the Miami Dolphins gets getting some visits. Also per source, Dolphins brought in FSU cornerback Jerry and Jones for a 30 visit today. He had three interceptions, a forced fumble, a fumble recovery, and five tackles for a loss as well as a sack last season. Um, in terms of Jerry and Jones, I think he's either a late day three pick or he's a UDFA. Uh, now, obviously, you know, he's had, what, five interceptions over the last three years. He had three last year alone. Um, I've watched a little bit about him. I know everyone blew up on him because of his combine testing, right? He ran like a 4 3 8 40, 2 5 3, 20 yard shuttle, a 1 5 3, 10 yard. Um, he had a vert of 39 and a half, a broad jump of 10 uh, foot 9 inches. Um, you know, I, listen, he's been a three year starter at, at FSU. I would love to hear ball games take on this, to be honest with you, right? Um, I think he, you know, I think he's, I think he projects as a nickel at the next level. Now, he did play a little boundary, but he found most of his success at FSU playing nickel. Um, you know, and I also think, you know, he offers you special teams as well, especially with that speed and, you know, he, he has been, use the special teams at FSU. Um, but I think this is a late day three or a UDFA pick. I do not think this is, you know, a day two pick. Shout out tonight. He gifted a Finside the NFL membership and Russell Swan is the benefactor of that. So shout out to you, Knight. Appreciate you growing the member community here. Um, so Jerry and Jones, next time I have ball game on, I'll get his thoughts on him because he's FSU and he's a cornerback guy. So there you go. Um, shout out to Bobby. The homie Bobby Shouse broke this yesterday. Um, FAU DT Evan Anderson visited with the Dolphins on a pre-draft visit. He's six foot, 320 pounds. Um, obviously, this again is another we're going to talk about this in a sec but this is another this is another very late day three or udfa guy that's what this is now he originally when he originally went to fau he was like 360 pounds and he shed that weight he's got a good work ethic you know um and you know he's played all four years, basically, started off as a freshman. Um, you know what I mean? So he's a powerful, powerful man when it comes to the upper body. Um, so, you know, now in terms of athleticism, he's not going to blow you off the charts. Um, but, you know, I think when you look at him, I think he might be a rotational piece at zero tech. That's what I think he probably projects as. 
Shout out to Jason Myers. He gifted a membership and BX was gifted that membership. So you see where we're going here? How many top 30 visits have we talked about and they're not day one guys? I even did a segment on this on a recent show. Are they using the top 30 visits to mask their round one and round two interests? Jackson Powers Johnson is as close as it got to bringing in a first round talent. Shout out to Pauly King. He gifted an NFL membership. And Eric Craver is the one who benefited from that. So shout out to you, Pauly King. Appreciate you continuing to grow the audience and grow the membership. I appreciate that. Over 300 of you in the chat, smash the like button, subscribe. If you are new and so, you know, how many of these 30 top 30 visits are actually guys that are first round targets? We've gone over the list of them. A lot of them aren't just saying finally here update on David long. He's switching to number 11. Uh, let's hope it works better for him than it did for Mike Wallace and Devontae Parker. And I also got to shout out David Long because if you have a David Long jersey, if you have a number 51 David Long Dolphins jersey, go on, hop on X and reply to him because he's offering to replace them with number 11 jerseys. So shout out to David Long for taking care of the fans. Let's hope you have better luck in that 11 than we have had in the past. Because, man, it's been tough. It has been tough for guys rocking that number. It has been a tough one. Um, where are you? Rome Gray. Rome Gray said, and he asked a, he asked a pretty damn good question. If you ask me, all right, he asked a pretty damn good question here. And, you know, always got to go back to the Yale, right? I know you're asking this, especially after we saw their interest in Tipton, right? A guy, me and Neil hadn't even watched yet. And, and they're out here, you know, showing love, but he asked, Hey, Rees, um, is Mike obsessed with, or at least preaching for Kieran Amagaji um, because of his raw talent and both being Yale guys? I mean, that's a, you know, Hey, that's a good point. He could, I mean, the kid's got a high ceiling, right? He's got a, he's definitely got, he's got a lot of power, right? You know, he's got underrated quickness in his feet can reach the second level really well. He's decent in space. The only questions I would have is, you know, he can miss it. He, you know, he can get caught lunging his blocks. He can overextend or overset his feet. Um, you know, the leap from the Ivy League to the NFL in terms of competition is huge. Got to clean up the hands. But, yeah, he's a raw guy that, you know, with a little bit of development, you might have something there. He's got a pretty high ceiling, I would say. So, I would be more comfortable with taking a player like that in the third, though. You know, like at 21 or 55, eh. Like he's my number 11 OT, right? So, but hey, I could see Mike McDaniel liking his Yale guys, right? Because the one thing that they probably all have by going to Yale is up here. And we know up here translates real well to the next level. So that's a good question. Um, I don't have the answer to that. But I would imagine he there's some fascination. If we saw him have fascination in Tipton, the receiver, I imagine there's going to be some fascination right there. So, um, listen, you know, hey, you ain't wrong. He said that's why you have Taron Armstead. He was a small school guy and got a lead, so he'd be a great teacher too. It's been hitting me constantly lately. Okay, so let me ask you this, Ron Gray. Where would you be comfortable taking with him? Would you be comfortable taking with him at 55? You know, let me ask you, I got to ask you that. Would you be comfortable taking him at 55? 
Now, remember, you brought up Armstead. Armstead didn't go until pick 75 in the third round. That's where... I, I, like, I would be comfortable with him in the third round on I mean, Kieran Amagaji. Uh, possible stupid question. Do you think the lack of edge grabs is a nod to Phillips and Chubb's health or a possible 4-3 switch? Um, no, they're they're doing their homework. I mean, they, they brought in, they wanted to bring in Carl Lawson, and I think edge is very much in play in the draft. Hell no, not 55, but that trade on for third or fourth. You know I'm banging for that. Yeah. If you got if you pick up a third round pick and you address him with the third round pick, I'm all for it. 110%. If you take him in that third or fourth, that's a sweet spot for a player like that, and I'm down. So guys, smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new. I appreciate each and every one of you. If news breaks tomorrow, I'll be back. If not, expect me on Monday. You already know what time it is. Fins up all day, every day. I'll see y'all in the next.